This episode may as well be called the Cameo Car, because so many characters featured in the first season of Infinity Train make appearances in this carnival-themed locale. Nancy from the Straight Up Italy car is there operating a pasta stand, Khaki Bottoms survived the steward's assault on the ball pit car, although all the machine gunnery and destruction resulted with the loss of an ear. Grage, a denizen from the Crystal car, is doing some DDR. And yeah, an editing timer got left up there in the corner accidentally. I really like how in the storyboard, Grage is leaning back with his arms supporting his weight in the same way that extremely high-level DDR players orient themselves. It implies that Grage is really good at this game. Unfortunately, this did not really translate into the final episode. Crystal people are a bit too blocky to animate moving at extremely high speeds, I guess. But hey, the dude still dances better than I probably could. There's also a tortoise, a corgi, Randall, one of those weird tiny wizards that shoot laser beams from their eyes who operate a stand where you shoot laser guns. Very fitting. There's even a reference to running away from those roach dogs! The Toad wasn't in the first season, obviously, but he also makes a recurring appearance, and he's got a flashing new cape. He picked a new name of Terence, and is getting kicked on his own terms. For money. Please pay to kick me. And it's always a pleasure to hear the smooth, sultry tones of... The Cat. Tulip, what are you still doing on the train? Hearing genuine concern for Tulip's well-being in the cat's voice was such a sweet moment, she really did develop a fondness for the girl. You're my favorite person, arbitrarily named after a particular kind of flower. Now, the cat having the hots for Jesse was kinda weird. Now, who is this tomcat you have with you? Well, I think I know what a handsome young passenger like Jesse might need. Not even gonna comment further on that. So, despite all the various character appearances, the focus of the episode was very much on the bond Jesse and Lake developed, and it was a pleasure to watch them cooperate toward a shared goal. I want to mention that I really enjoyed the lighthearted argument the episode starts off with, where Jesse was continuing to find even more Mirror World questions that befuddled and exasperated Lake. I don't know, it's like... <sighs> I, I don't know! That's an amusing little moment on the meta level as well, considering how open-ended and confusing Mirror World physics would get if one wanted to dig deep into it. Heck, in my review of the Toad Car, I spent a couple minutes theorizing on the logistics of how the Flex traverse across planes of existence, and that's really only scratching the tip of the iceberg when it comes to concepts one could hypothesize convoluted constructs for. Like a mirror reflecting a bunch of other mirrors, it's as confusing as you want to make it. Something else worth pointing out from this silly little squabble is that Lake and Jesse have great chemistry at this point in the season in terms of how their personalities play off of each other. Lake can still be just as high strung as she was in the previous train cars, but you can feel a tangible difference in her emotional state, primarily because all the hostility and distress she had toward Jesse is now completely gone. Do you know how every part of your body works? Like, why do your blood cells look like tiny inner tubes? Because they're in a liquid and that's how they float? They don't... Wait, is that true? Yeah! Wait, isn't it? They're so comically chummy in their pseudo-bickering. Their personality combo would probably allow for them to make some entertaining video game Let's Plays, which I guess they totally could do if they wanted to after the season ends. I guess I should throw a bone to those who are into shipping. Uh, I'm not into it, but it is indeed very easy to see how Lake and Jesse as a couple would appeal for those people. Many of the interactions between them are indeed very cute. The Lucky Cat Car also establishes that the existential struggle Lake is navigating spreads beyond just the mirror world and the mirror police. The point discrepancy between passengers and train denizens makes Lake feel that her desires will always be undermined to serve the passengers. It would be hard not to feel lesser when your attempts have literally been decided to mean less by the powers that be. The point is that everything and everyone on this train wants me to fail. I found this dialogue quite interesting because Lake doesn't even really have specific personal goals. She's just trying to avoid the mirror police while carving out her own identity. Merely the act of trying to exist on your own terms is an uphill battle where the odds are unfairly stacked against Lake. And escaping the mirror plane did not change that, it just reduced the severity of the oppression. Lake has also had no support system to aid in her fight. 
Until now, Jesse really steps it up with the emotional support. Check out that determined look in his eyes. Hey, I don't want you to fail and I'm on the train. And who cares about them? Once my number gets to zero, we're all leaving anyway. What? What what? Lake being flabbergasted and at a loss for words was such heartfelt emotional payoff. It's the culmination of all the work both Lake and Jesse put into forging their relationship, and it's probably the first time Lake has ever experienced somebody caring for her that deeply and also wanting her in their life. Being wanted for who you are, that's something Lake has never had, and it's just... Ah, uh, it's so heartwarming. And in terms of plot development, it's also a defining moment because it sets up the entire tail end of the season. The audience at this point, when watching the series for the first time, would be wondering if it's even possible for a construct of the train to cross over into the real world, and I remember being really excited with where the series was going to go when I first saw this episode. My excitement grew even more when the identity of the masked figure was revealed to be somebody else whose face we saw back in the first season. We briefly saw her appear on Amelia's computer in the episode The Engine, and we saw back then that her number was very large. Hey kid, what's your number at? Four? <sighs> we'll have to fix that back at my base. I loved the dramatic irony here, as Jesse and Lake utterly failed to realize what Grace actually meant. This car was cheating you. I think she's okay. She's letting us use the exit when she doesn't really have to. Jesse, I just discussed in my review of the previous episode how I thought your number went down because you realized you should maybe be a bit more cautious in regards to the motivations of others. But here you go again, trusting others without first understanding what their motivations are. You slip up so easily, Jesse. God damn it, I love that. Jesse is really prone to making the same mistakes, but he does it in a way that's very believable for his character. I was also a fan of how Grace and the Cat were implied to have an antagonistic history. This isn't over, Grace. Try me, the cat. I'm curious to see whether the cat will attempt to get revenge in Season 3. I could chat about Grace and the Apex a bit more, but they're the stars of the next episode, so I'm gonna save it for then. I hope you join me in my review of the mall car when I get that video finished and uploaded, and as always, thanks for watching.